I already knew this was one of the most well-organized conferences I've ever been to. This is definitely the first time I have been early <laughs> to a time slot. So this is, this is a good start. I really want to thank AHP and especially Linda Frazier, Neil Schiffman, and Jane Allen for this invitation to a conference that I had never heard of. And frankly, when I did hear about it, it sounded too good to be true. The fact that it's an elegant and simple idea doesn't take away from the incredible amount of work that it takes to facilitate a space for, not a debate, but a conversation among diverse people, and most importantly, the experts and the decision makers, and with special attention being paid this year to discuss equity and to include the communities most affected by the decisions being made. As a longtime activist for cannabis legalization and racial and social justice before I became a regulator, it feels especially appropriate to be having this conversation in Los Angeles, of course, one of the biggest and most influential cannabis markets in the world, and along with Massachusetts, one of the first jurisdictions to have a cannabis equity program and to be committed to it despite how challenging it is. I was actually here at this exact hotel, the Westin Bonaventure, um, in 2011 for the Drug Policy Alliance International Con uh, Conference. I had just left a new career as a tax lawyer um, to join the legalization movement. I was listening to all the panels. I was like, maybe I'll be on a panel in one of these rooms one day. And it seemed like our dream of sensible health-focused policies might come true someday if we fought hard enough, and if maybe somebody powerful would listen. Back then, things were very black and white, especially to the rest of the world. Everything was framed as pro-pot or anti-pot. Either you're a crazy weed lover or you're a reefer mad prohibitionist. And then 2012 happened, and then 2014, and 2016, and 2018. And as legalization became a reality, a lot more complicated questions have been raised. And so to be back here eight years later, I feel like it's a great time to say, let's throw out the pro-pot versus anti-pot paradigm right here. Because as I see it, there's a whole new goal and struggle. And the solution is way more complex than just getting someone powerful to flip a switch. It's about all of us using whatever voice and whatever resources we have in the fight for who will control this new world. Money, power, and fear, or science, justice, and collaboration. So let's get right to the question that I know some of you are thinking. The point of this conference is to be neutral and objective. So what does a legalization activist know about being neutral and objective? I'll start by telling you the same thing that I say in interviews. Um, which is 100% true, which is I am adamantly for legalization. So not arresting people for possession, for personal growing, for regulated, I'm for regulated tax product sales. But beyond that, I don't have an agenda. I think it's about what science shows and what data shows. I don't have an agenda for what should be in a public awareness campaign or precisely what a serving size should be or how tall a plant needs to be before it gets a tag. These are things where we've looked at the data available and made a decision. And once you take legalization as a given, you can put smart, diverse people together and make an evidence-based decision on any of those things. I don't see a pro-pot or anti-pot or pro-legalization pro or anti-legalization stance on any of those questions. So that's my sincere answer um, for when I'm asked about that and when I want to be well-behaved. But I was asked to do this keynote to be real. And so I'm going to keep it 100, as they say, and I'm going to go a little further and add something that a lot of people, a lot of people of color in particular, feel about these words, neutral and objective, as they relate to drugs, people who use drugs, and drug laws. So I think most people, if you're here and you have some expertise, you're aware that marijuana became illegal not because of public health concerns, but to advance a racist agenda in which to build support for prohibition, officials waved, waged a public campaign 
run the 30s, arguing that Mexican and black people specifically threatened the nation's stability through sexual promiscuity and violence caused by marijuana use. Less people, fewer people know that according to an article in the California Review, Law Review, there were also claims that California Hindus, who were not actually Hindus but were in fact Sikh Punjabis who had recently begun immigrating to California, were using cannabis or Indian hemp and specifically spreading it to whites. If you skip to when the war on drugs was waged in the 1960s and 1970s, language had begun to shift away from openly racist words, and it was more technically race neutral, but dog whistles that were used as code to drum up support for the war on drugs. According to President Nixon's advisor, John Ehrlichman, he said later, something that I try to remember every time the process for economic justice gets overwhelming, he said, we knew that by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities, we could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about those drugs? Of course we did. So in this context, when I hear neutral and objective, I think of a couple things. First, those sanitized clinical words paint a picture that we're starting from zero, creating drug policy with no sense of history beyond, at best, the data that it's produced. But for anyone who has been tangled up in the legal system over a possession charge, or has a loved one who couldn't get a job because of a felony record for small-time pot dealing, or who has lost years of life in a cage for crimes that only seem to get enforced against people of color, our drug laws are a deeply emotional issue, and they should be. I occasionally hear people say, let's just take all the emotion out of it and have a rational conversation. Well, if you don't understand why there's emotion, then you're missing the context that you need to have a rational conversation. Thank you. Second, culture changes over time in terms of what is acceptable to say. But the constant is that neutral and objective and serious, or it's serious, tends to be associated with people with certain privilege, and I'm one of them. It's easy to dismiss Henry Ann Singer's remarks because probably it could never happen today. But let's just understand that was less than 100 years ago on the floor of the US Senate that he said cannabis should be illegal because black men use it to seduce white women on the floor of the US Senate, and senators found that persuasive, and they probably would have described it as neutral and objective. So how can we act like that doesn't matter? How can we pretend like that has passed and doesn't have an impact on what goes on today, and that we have no role in fixing that? Sometimes just by virtue of privilege that you have, anything that you say is considered neutral and objective, whether or not you're intending to use that privilege. And so, as you move through this conference and these sessions, if you start to feel inspired, I hope you do, and you're looking for ways to contribute to equity, I encourage you to stop and double check sometimes. When you are questioning something or you're putting forth an opinion, are you maybe unconsciously taking advantage of that? privilege that you have, being considered neutral, objective? Are you putting forth a reasonable, serious man or woman spin on something when in fact maybe you could make that opinion or that question or that statement more multifaceted and informed by bringing in other voices? And I'm not even talking about Henry Ann Singer type remarks. I'm talking about everyday remarks, everyday opinions, uh, especially when you're talking about people who use drugs, um, you might be sharing something that's stigmatizing. Maybe if you talk to someone from another perspective or from the community you're talking about, it will be even more informed. I'm a very strong believer in meeting people where they're at, and if that's all you take away from this, this morning, that's fine, that is good. And it is imminent that I'll be sitting there listening to a talk at some point in this conference, and you'll need to meet me where I'm at. And that's fine, because we all came from different places, but we're all here now. That's what matters.
And I'm not saying you shouldn't use these words, neutral and objective, by the way. I use them all the time. They are useful words and a concept that almost always represents good intentions. But I propose just that, starting right now at this conference, instead of thinking of neutral and objective as meaning starting from zero, we think of neutral as acknowledging the past, especially our role and our institution's roles, preferably without judgment, just acknowledgement and building that into what comes next. I could talk about the role um, of Massachusetts, the Massachusetts government in disproportionate enforcement of drug laws, well documented by racial disparities, just like every other state, and how we are acknowledging and addressing that in our marijuana policy, which is true. But instead, uh, I want to admit something that's a lot more vulnerable for me. In the spirit of all of us, taking this definition of neutral and objective seriously. I'm going to admit that as a whole, I think the marijuana legalization movement is guilty of often framing things in a way that implicitly reinforces some of the troublesome concepts of marijuana prohibition. What do I mean by that? The California Law Review article I mentioned earlier, which is called White Individualism in Marijuana Legalization Campaigns, an article I highly recommend, is basically a paper that calls out several legalization campaigns, including Colorado, which I worked on, Washington, Oregon, and Alaska, for putting forth messages and images that suggest that white, hardworking, middle-class marijuana consumers are deserving beneficiaries of legalized marijuana, which the author terms white exceptionalism, and that by perpetuating this, we perpetuate those same harms and double standards that have led to the well-known racial disparities in the war on drugs. So implicitly, it sends a message that different people deserve different consequences for the same actions. So the article gives an example. There's an ad that was run by the Colorado campaign in 2012, which I remember very well. A good friend of mine who was a fellow staffer on the campaign did the voiceover for this ad. It came out on Father's Day. And it features a young white man sitting in a park writing, in a writing a letter that says, Dear Dad, you know how you enjoy a drink after work? Well, in many ways, I'm just like you. I have a good job, I work hard, but when I get home, I prefer to relax with marijuana. According to the paper, this message signals notions of individual merit, hard work, individual responsibility, and white exceptionalism. There was a similar ad around Mother's Day where a young white woman says she feels safer around marijuana users, which the paper article, excuse me, which the article implicitly says is an effort to assuage white anxiety about racialized bad others associated with marijuana. And then, here's the kicker for me, the article goes on to say that these types of framings have tended to correlate with policies that favor white marijuana entrepreneurs, which is precisely the biggest problem that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, which started in the early legalization states and has since persisted. I know for sure that there was no ill intent in creating those ads, but I have to acknowledge it and ask, what if those ads had been different? What might look different today? And so I tell you this story to show you that everyone has been a part of this system in one way or the other. And it's really easy to get defensive. When I first read that Law Review article when it came out, I had a moment like, this kid had no idea what he's doing. He didn't know what prohibition was like. We could have lost Colorado. He didn't know how tough it was. I have a lot of pride and I have a lot of respect for my colleagues. And I, and there, like I said, there was no ill intent. But I tried going back with acknowledgement and no judgment and no blame, frankly, because I was trying to think of a good example for this presentation. And I can neutrally look at what happened and say that for future legalization campaigns, if they have a focus on racial justice and social justice from the get-go, that may be correlated with more fair and more inclusive policies, which is exactly what we tried to do in Massachusetts. So let me tell you a little bit about Massachusetts. Um, one question I get a lot is, how did you get to this position? Sometimes asked 
innocently and sometimes with the subtext of who the hell made you a commissioner? <laughs> the answer is uh, in a series of decisions made by the Massachusetts legislature to make the agency that controls cannabis as independent, transparent, and accountable as possible. When the legislature changed the original ballot initiative in 2017, they made the Cannabis Control Commission a new independent agency with five members and added specific areas that the person who should be appointed to each seat should have. Public safety, public health, business, government regulation, and social justice. When I got the call inviting me to apply for that last seat, I thought maybe they were mixing me some, with somebody else or they forgot to check my Twitter or somebody was about to get fired. But surprisingly, that's not what happened. After thoughtful and honestly enjoyable interviews with each of them, I got the call the day before the announcement that the state treasurer, attorney general, and governor were jointly appointing me to serve on the commission. That's another check, by the way, that the legislature put in um, to make sure that the selections are never controlled by just one office. It's under three different offices. So before the five of us met, we learned about each other through the newspaper when the announcements were made. And one of the first things that was announced was that, um, based on questions from the press, I was the only one of the five who had voted yes to legalize marijuana. And there were headlines like, opponents of marijuana selected to control marijuana board. The truth, however, turned out to be a lot more nuanced. Steve Hoffman, who's the chairman of the commission and a former Bain executive who worked with Mitt Romney, surprised all of us at his first ever press conference when he described how he had gone to Colorado the previous year and bought a joint on the 4th of July and smoked it before he watched the fireworks. And my other three colleagues, uh, Commissioner Doyle, Doyle, who had helped to run the medical marijuana program, Commissioner Flanagan, who's a former state senator, um, is a leader in mental health and substance abuse, and Commissioner McBride, who, in addition to her public safety expertise, led foreclosure prevention for homeowners and jail diversion for veterans, um, were all a lot more nuanced. And what we ended up with, thank goodness, was not a commission of me and four prohibitionists. Instead, we have five people with different views and valuable experiences who were all committed to promptly implementing that law. We've disagreed sometimes sharply over which direction to take on specific issues, but pulling the emergency brake, um, delaying or taking an easy way out has never been on the table. We're doing this and each of the five commissioners has worked hard toward that end and I can't praise the people who appointed us enough for finding five diverse people who are able to think critically and reasonably. Although it's not always easy for any of us to work with four other people who are completely different from us, I strongly believe that it has led to better decisions. Much like how studies show diverse juries make better decisions because they exchange more information and consider a broader range of facts more thoroughly before making a decision, so has our commission had to be more thorough in our evaluation and policy making by having to discuss and defend our positions with four people from four different backgrounds. By the way, that's what I love about this conference as well. It's not just researchers, it's not just clinicians, prevention experts, state officials, um, it's all of us. And of course this year there's the emphasis on people from the different communities that we're trying to benefit. And I think in the same way, making that space for all of us to be in a conversation together makes the quality of this conference better. Another thing that makes the process in Massachusetts um, fun and better that it also has in common with this conference is the conversations are public. We have a uniquely strict open meeting law that does not allow the majority of our commission, so three people, to have a conversation about anything substantive. So that means when we were first appointed, we only had five people, we were in five cubicles in borrowed space, and we couldn't talk about anything except like the weather until we got into a table on a stage like this and we had to be like, hey, so we have this whole industry to regulate, you guys wanna like split it up? And have that whole conversation with TV cameras in our face. It was really hard, but we got used to it and 
It's all for the better because the public gets to watch us have every licensing and policy and every other substantive conversation truly from scratch um, and understand where the decision came from. Even when it sometimes get, gets awkward, like at our last meeting when one of the applicants had listed that they were planning to make moon rocks and I knew that was a cannabis product, but I couldn't remember what it was. And one of my colleagues thought it was candy, but she wasn't sure if she was thinking of pop rocks or moon rocks. And we had to have this whole discussion in public. But everybody knew exactly what we were thinking. We have expert advisory groups, um, and I think that leads to better decision making as well. We have a whole list of 25 people with expertise in everything from cultivation, manufacturing, retail, to public safety, to minority business ownership, substance abuse, civil rights, social justice, the whole gamut, and the group is really diverse and meets in public too. So um, you see things like a, at one of the last meetings that they had, the patient representative was explaining to the commissioner of the Department of Agriculture um, what a quartz nail is for dabbing. It's a very unusual group of people having conversations um, that you probably would never see at any other table. Um, but it makes our decisions better. And it's really important, I think, for us to have humility and know that we can't be experts in everything. And so we rely on advisory groups. And that brings me to another element of what I think is the real meaning of neutral and objective, which I know a lot of you share, and that's the willingness and even eagerness to be challenged. So I promise I won't make this a commercial for Massachusetts, but I do want to tell you about our research agenda. When the legislature decided to expand upon the law that voters passed in 2016, they included a specific mandate for the research agenda for adult use cannabis in particular to us understand the social and economic trends of marijuana in the Commonwealth, inform decisions that aid in the elimination of the illicit market, I would have said minimize, uh, and inform decisions on the public health, health impacts of marijuana. So we have started building out a research team that's head by our research director, Dr. Julie Johnson. Um, in collaboration with the Department of Public Health, we launched a statewide public awareness campaign that focuses on youth prevention and responsible consumption, informed by 18 focus groups that were conducted throughout the state last year. And we've begun to collaborate with state agencies, academics, think tanks, and other researchers to examine other research items. Dr. Johnson presented to the commission several months ago about her plan to connect diverse stakeholders that are authorized to conduct high quality impactful studies, which will help us to monitor the effects of Massachusetts marijuana laws. Um, and the department re recently issued a report on impaired driving, which is available on our website, masscannabiscontrol.com. And I encourage all of you to take advantage of that research, which is for the public benefit, and particularly um, people in other states who are trying to make decisions. On that note, we also recently concluded an RFR process to identify a company to create our business intelligence and open data solution to ensure that all of this information that our agency and the people of Massachusetts have isn't just sitting on a computer in our government offices, but rather open to everyone to find insights and hold us accountable, and for all other government agencies to use to make informed decisions. And so the private sector can make better decisions too. So keep an eye on the commission to make sure that you have access to that data warehouse as well. I want to highlight six areas where I'm particularly proud of how we use data in our decision making. The first three I relied heavily on my colleagues um, with expertise in those areas. And I know there are experts here who will be going into great detail on those topics. Um, but I can say that I'm really proud of the way that we used experience from other states, uh, particularly in terms of what our public awareness campaign looks like. And in other areas, we were bold. Um, environmental regulations were one of the areas where I believe we were um, the first or one of the first states uh, to put limits on our licensees. And we're keeping close track of that and making sure um, that information is available for everyone. The last three were policies that I led. Our earlier definition of neutral and objective acknowledged the role of the past. So in that vein, our diversity plan, positive impact plan, and our social equity program are a way to include communities disproportionately harmed in the legal industry as required by our legal mandate. 
Um, we'll be digging into that today at a Lunch and Learn session um, with Kat Packer, who's the Executive Director of the um, LA Department of Cannabis Regulation. So if you're interested in talking about what a social equity program looks like interactively, I encourage you to come to that session. Um, the diversity plan is just a way to allow slash force <laughs> our licensees to benefit from the inherent uh, benefits of having diversity. So they have to submit to us, how will you include all these different populations? How will you measure um, how you are going towards your own goals that you've named? And then we make sure that they're following it. And then lastly, the positive impact plan is how they contribute in their own same creative, innovative methods that they bring to everything else um, to helping disproportionately impacted communities. So we've seen things like um, career fairs, incubators, accelerators. Um, sometimes it's just giving to charity. They're all over the map, but the point is to help them look at the culture of their own organization and make their own impact that they can be proud of. If I can oversimplify for a minute and paint with a very broad brush, many of you who have or would vote against legalization, we might have been on opposite sides before. But I believe we have a common goal through a common adversary, and it's on this slide. If I can oversimplify again, I'll say that the people of Massachusetts, as well as the legislature and state government, are generally unified in wanting the cannabis business to be diverse and characterized by people of all backgrounds, farmers, veterans, people of color, small local businesses, minority women-owned businesses, um, and co-ops and micro-businesses in particular, and not so much big out-of-state companies. But that has proved very challenging for complex reasons that I would boil down to, if I had to do it in one sentence, rigorous barriers to entry, and market requirements that demand large amounts of capital, unreasonably large amounts of capital. And thus, despite our best intentions and best efforts, we favor the already privileged and essentially encourage big marijuana. I was recently reading about the filings from a couple weeks ago from a lawsuit where Attorney General Maura Healey, the Attorney General from Massachusetts, is suing the Sackler family behind Purdue Pharma. I will tell A.G. Healy she got a round of applause. Alleging that they had misled doctors and patients about OxyContin's risk, leading to more patients on higher doses for long periods, and influencing predatory deregulation.